So off we go, recording. Um, so hi, everybody. So this is the monthly meeting, you know, so um, welcome to that. <laughs> it feels like a weekly meeting sometimes to some, but this is officially the monthly meeting. And I did send out an agenda ahead of time that I'd like to kind of address. I think we have some regular updates that we'd like to do and maybe two items that I think might require a little bit of action. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start with the first one, which is the Google Doc thing that Georg sent out uh, yesterday or something that's received quite a bit of feedback already. Georg, could you maybe just real quickly give an overview of what the problem or concern was and then where we're at right now? Yeah, Daniel can probably do that better because he was the one who shared yesterday during the game at the call what happened okay. when we worked in Google Docs and the owner of the document. You have an echo here. I don't know why. That might not be your fault. Okay. So Daniel, can you share again what you shared yesterday in the DNI working group about Google Docs and using books? Uh, you mean sharing sure the sense of the experience? Hey, Sus, I think there's a lot of echo or some kind of interference on your side. I keep seeing your... Okay, thanks. What about now? Is it working? Yeah, better. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, basically what it happened is that we had like uh, all of the minutes from previous meetings, like I don't remember, uh, 100 pages. Uh, so working in a similar way as we are working in chaos um, because the owner of the document left the organization uh, that person belongs to or kind of this that account was removed so all of the documents were removed so we lost part of the work we've done there like tens of pages so my I was worried yesterday about hey we should do something here having a backup or whatever because if not we are gonna lose a lot of documents here and there Okay. Um, and as all of you know, we use Google Docs pretty heavily across all of our working groups and the software groups and pretty much everything. So, so I think that was a eye opener and we don't want to lose this information. Hmm. Well, thank you to everyone who contributed to the discussion on the mailing list. If I were to sum it up, there are um, some ideas for using different tools. Um, one idea was what the Evolution Working Group has done for a while is to create markdown files after every meeting and store the meeting minutes in the repository, which I think is a good idea. It just requires having someone to do it after every meeting. And uh, this, I had proposed to create a Google Suite organization for chaos, but then um, someone on the mailing list reminded us, reminded me that we can also have a free Google account that we just share, and this free Google account stays with chaos and the government board manages it. And then I think that is the solution that I personally prefer. But this is up for discussion. Yeah, that, that would work for me. Any, yeah, okay. Any other thoughts on this? My one hesitation, I like the idea of Markdown, but it's one more thing to do. And as we have really a lot of meetings during the week from working groups and um, like software groups as well, just making sure that this is consistently done every week or every other week across all working groups is just, it's a bit onerous. That's all. That's my one concern about the markdown. So the, 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 the I think the workflow when using Google Docs, we use Google Docs during the meeting from what I understand and then take the results and then just move them into a markdown. So during the meeting, we would actually collaborate in a Google Doc. And if that vanishes in a week, <laughs> no big deal because it's stored as Markdown in the repository. 
Right. It was in response to, I think Andy had posted a comment. So that's my one concern with Markdown. I don't have any problem with it technically or anything. It's just one, one more layer of things to manage. Any other why, thoughts? Why not export them to a PDF document? I mean, is there going to be any, after the meeting is over, is there going to be any need for further additions or collaboration? There's probably not going to be any further additions to the notes. Rarely have I ever gone back in and had to edit something. So why not just shove them out, just export them to a PDF and leave them static? And then if somebody wants to go back and read them, there they are. OK. The other thing we could do is get more disciplined about just posting them to the mailing list. Because if we had all the notes archived on the mailing list, then it wouldn't be a big deal if we lost a document. Yeah, and we used to do that fairly regularly. Yeah, um, I know I never do it for, for common. I probably should. Okay. Would it create too much? Do we care about noise on the mailing list? No. It hasn't been noisy so far. Documents. What's that? It hasn't been noisy so far. No, you're right. Whatever we choose, I would go for something with a really low barrier. So I would keep using Google Docs, perhaps. Okay. Um, yeah, because there are people that don't feel that comfortable even trying to commit in something. So Google Doc works quite straightforward. Okay. That's all. OK, so it's mostly just um, the question then is the workflow would be to continue to use Google Docs. <laughs> it's really this archiving part. That it's whether it's a list, it's PDF, or it's Markdown. It appears those are the three options right now. And certainly not all three. <laughs> that would be too much. <laughs> um, thoughts? Uh, any other thoughts? Well, just um, a minor comment. If um, in Google Docs you take the notes using Markdown, mm -hmm. Mark, at the end of the meeting, it's only a matter of cut and paste and a full request that everybody who attended can also check just in case they want to add anything at all. And the same markdown can be sent to the email, the mailing list, because it's basically a readable format so that uh, there's a raw uh, markdown is good enough for the minutes. Yeah, just my two cents. So I understand that still you need some volunteer after the meeting to do the cut and paste and uh, all of that. So uh, I know that. But for okay. me, it's convenient. Okay. I mean, maybe um, maybe a solution would be to first ask folks to send it to the mailing list, and if the working groups would like to document it in Markdown, that would be easy enough to do. Uh, Feedback would be good. <laughs> I know you've all said things, but it'd be nice to come to a consensus. I don't want me to be the consensus maker here. I mean, I think I'm just trying to synthesize what people are saying. I think there are greater and lesser degrees of worry about this. Uh, Daniel probably worrying most since it's happened to him. Um, but I think the solution that's the solution that you discussed works for ensuring that an archive outside of the box. The solution being sending it to the list? Sending it to the list. I think, and it's up to the groups if they want to maintain a separate markdown or conversion. Okay. It. Okay. okay, so based on what I've been hearing, I've put together a proposal that I will send to the main list, and that is we can create a free Google account and have the documents owned by this account. That way we eliminate the risk of just losing the document. But then as an additional step, all the working group can decide whether they prefer to post the minutes to mailing lists or archive them in their repositories markdown. OK. Or even perhaps even accounting for Brian's comment, store it as a PDF, just some, some historical record. Yeah. One okay. thing about Google Docs is um, that it's not um, available in China. I mean, there mm -hmm. are workarounds. Just in general, uh, it may not concern us right now, just as a long-term thought. Mm -hmm. 
um, regarding tools um, that are not necessarily available all around the globe. Okay. Don't have to address that now. Just wanted to highlight as we are talking about Google Docs. Yep, that's fair. Yeah, we've had a lot of conversations about that within the Kubernetes community. Okay. Um, and we've we've kept Google Docs um, mainly because the Kubernetes community is massive, right? So anything that we anything that we pick would eventually get big enough that would get blocked in China anyways. And so you get you get this like trying to stay ahead of tools being blocked in China, which we don't want to get in the habit of. Uh, I'm not sure that applies to the Chaos Project though, because we could use some obscure tool that that nobody uses. But but um, Ildiko's got a really good point. Okay. Um, has anybody heard in the Chaos Project? Has anybody heard anybody mention this at all? I mean, maybe it's something that we, you know, cross that bridge when we come to it. No, I only heard it uh, on the mailing list. Yeah, in response to the yeah, discussion brought it up. today, Ildiko, but. I think okay. we should just be thinking ahead of it so that we don't cut, uh, get ourselves caught up when the situation happens. Just as we have plan A, Google Doc, but plan B, we should have a plan B. In sure. case something should happen, then we know how to switch. Okay, that's fair. Um, I'm just taking some notes. Okay. Does anybody have a plan B that we might, I could check it out or that other people use? I think like uh, what Nicole said, I think we should have that in thought. Then from the mailing list as well, a couple of uh, tools were mentioned. I also mentioned like the IFA part, which some communities like OpenStack yeah. and many others are using. It's very good for versioning as well. Okay. So you can play back in time to see, you know, the changes that, across, that appeared across the phone. Okay. Then at some point, if you want to export it, HTML, PDF, whatever version, the options are available. Great. Okay. Thanks, Armstrong. Uh, all right. Any other comments on mm -hmm. this? Good. Thanks. Um, let's see. Software. Does anybody want to? I know that the. Uh, folks from Grimoire Lab and folks from Augur have been meeting on a weekly basis to talk about software development in the open. I think this has been really great from my perspective. So does anybody from Augur? Sean, you're here. You I am here. Tell us kind of what's going on most lately with Augur? Oh. <coughs> um, most we most, most yeah. uh, lately with Augur is we're doing a workshop with Grace Hopper on Thursday. And so we spent a good deal of time getting the installation and user, new developer experience uh, fine tuned. And okay. I, I think we're in a pretty good place there now. Um, so that's that's a big thing. We've also started to add to our machine learning capabilities with um, the Insight Worker. And so that's, that's coming along nicely. And we've also made, um, there's some really great feedback, I think two weeks ago tomorrow, about user interface, and we have made a ton of changes uh, to the first interface that people see on the Augur webpage for people who want to try our interface. Can you show it? Um, really you have a... I have I have one that includes like uh, some of the most recent things. Um, this one I updated. Might be nice to show it. Yeah. I'm trying to find that. Okay. It seems we've lost the Zoom window, which I don't know why that happens. So what are, while you're pulling that up, can you talk yeah. and pull something? What are you doing machine learning wise? You had mentioned machine um, learning. We're identifying trends in the repositories and okay. events that are outside of a certain tolerance of those events of those trends. So, like, if you have a, a, a mean rate and standard deviation, just using very simple statistics um, for a set of metrics, we'll identify things that fall out of that band automatically, okay. and we'll also identify things that um, fall uh, um, 
that you could specify. So if you just want to be notified when when, uh, when something's happening, uh, okay. when you get more than ten messages or whatever on the issue. So these are some some projects, and probably one of the big things you'll note is that the the sidebar now is simplified. The landing page is what people might expect, which would be the currently stored groups instead of insights. So if I you know, just the navigation is, is much simpler back to the way that it used to be because some of the feedback that we got was, I'd like to see it the way that it used to be. Um, and so this is all the repositories in there. And we'll see, lines of code, uh, pull requests, um, commits, and there aren't issues on here yet. And I think it's just still pulling this giant graph here for separate. So yeah, that's that's kind of what you have in Augur now. So some of the things that we had in our old interface are restored as well. Our comparisons of our work in the new interface. So, so yeah. is the, so if you scroll down a little bit, yeah. Are these are these some are the evolution the, metrics? Okay. Yeah. Are they the, defined? Go ahead. Yeah, they are. Um, we, looks like we haven't added back in those chaos metric links. Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Okay. I can put it in to add those back in. Um, okay. Now we have the download links so you can save it again too. Okay. And then, so all the evolution stuff is here. I just picked the repository that doesn't have any issue data yet. You're a little hard to understand sometimes, Sean. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to have congestion today and also probably not speaking close enough to the microphone. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's um, that's you know kind of an overview. We still have our. So if, you click on, if you click on, like go back. Yeah. So if you click on risk metrics there on the side, mm -hmm. does that go to risk metrics or not? It does. If I have, I don't think I have risk metrics run in this particular repository. I do. I I lied. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay. And uh, I know Matt had done a pull request to create the links. I don't know why those aren't showing up for some reason. Okay. Yeah, I think he had mentioned mm -hmm. creating links to the TLDR description. He did that and I merged that yesterday. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Okay. I'll talk to Matt Snell about that. Okay. And maybe the same on this is kind of marking some of these as chaos because I know mm -hmm. like the CII best practice badge is working forward as a risk yeah. metric and licenses yeah. declared and forks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's easy to do. We have those links embedded in the API documentation that each of these pictures comes from. So okay. it shouldn't be a problem to add it here. And then insights? Um, insights are where some of the machine learning is taking place. And this is, uh, we're working on the way that it's windowed so that it can be parameterized. But right now it takes a year of data and gives you anomalies over the last 90 days. Okay. And so for Comcast Trickster, it's one of the repositories that said a sharp decrease in issues 26 days ago. This is what it's saying. Um, but really, you could say it's an increase 24 days ago. Okay. So. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, questions or comments for Sean? On Augur? Awesome. I think the interface looks cleaner. It definitely looks cleaner. Okay. I'm going to try to stop sharing this. Oh, oh there it is. Stop share. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Yep. Um, Grimoire Lab. Things that you want to bring forward, tell folks about? Looking at you, oh. Georg, or? Jesus or Daniel? Yeah, it was a good review in what we were discussing before. Um, uh, the, the only, so there are a couple of documentation improvements, minor things, and then perhaps the most peaceful one is that a pull request from to have the day and the day of the week information in a chart uh, for the index is, is, was merged. So it's just a matter of creating now the dashboards for having this information. Okay. And that was around, was that around the particular, that was on um, the common metric? Was that right? That was Don, like, 
the, the metric that has come out of common that's about uh, the hour. time of contribution. Is that one? Is that what you're talking about? It was in common. I don't remember. Yeah, it comes out of common. So I think this was is I think this is the discussion that you were having last week with how yeah. to actually represent this. Yeah, so this is kind of also for you, Don, that that in the Grimoire Lab meetings they've been talking so this this was the metric that was um whether or not people were working inside or outside of business hours you remember that one and then in common it was kind of decided that business hours are not a great term and so it might be more sensible to think about when contributions are coming just in terms of time date and time and then abstractions could be made from that as to whether or not they're within business hours, but that's not the responsibility of the group. And then Grimoire Lab for the last, in their meetings for the last, I, I don't know, I wasn't there this week, but for the last couple of weeks, have been kind of working on ways to, to represent this in, in Grimoire Lab. So. Well, I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to remind you that you can test the alpha thousand that we are um, the coin. It's, uh, it's uh, the more lab as a service, ready to analyze the repository that you may want. So feel free to uh, report any problem or any issue that you may find with it. The idea is that you can select the repositories that you want to analyze in Git, GitLab, GitHub, and uh, Meetup. And then you can see some uh, uh, dashboards and all of that, and you can write your own visualizations in Kibana if you want. The, the the link is in the in the chat for this group. So this is the call. Okay, yeah, I see somebody put it in there. This is the cauldron stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a new a new version. If you know the the old cauldron from one year ago, this is a new version, completely uh, reengineered. And uh, well, I think it's it's better. But have a look at it. So what is this? So what does this give uh, for more lab? What is the cauldron? Running it as a service, is that, what's the case that that's going to happen? I see a lot of, uh, of noise in the background. Can you repeat, Matt? Yeah, so in kind of in pushing Cauldron forward a bit, what's the, the use case that this is planning on helping? Uh, right now, the use case is you want to know about some repositories. And uh, you don't want to deploy everything from scratch. You don't want to deploy the containers or everything. The only mm -hmm. thing that you want is just go to the website and see the staff and see the data. See. That's, that's what the Calvin provides. So the only thing okay. that you need to do is to select the repository you want to analyze, give it a bit of time because of the GitHub API it may, may take some time, but after some time, basically you get the data visualizations and everything. Gotcha. You don't need to deploy anything. So it's, it's like a, a service, right? So how much um, in using Cauldron, this is kind of a bigger question, but in using Cauldron, how much um, like refinement do I get, right? So like if I'm deploying Grimoire Lab locally, there's a ton of refinement that can be done. So mm -hmm. does Cauldron abstract some of that away or is it kind of predetermined? Yeah, in the case of Cauldron, the idea is you don't need to deploy anything because it's already in the cloud. Okay. So you just go there and, and it works. Of course, you can also deploy it if you want, because we sure. have everything is automated so that you can also have Ansible, Ansible um, uh, cookbooks for, for doing that. But if you don't want, you just go to the website and, and, and do your staff and that's it. Nothing deploy it, nothing, just just work with the data. Okay, so in terms of what Cauldron displays, oh, go ahead, Gary. When you go to Cauldron right now, it shows you uh, four graphs to start with. And then you, you can pull it up. Do you have it in front of you? I, I do can. it when I'm trying to like talk. Yeah, I can do that real quick. Okay. Um, let me open the window, share my screen. Okay. So this is Cauldron. And yeah. You can see I already uh, clicked on analyze the project a few times to create different dashboards. Here's one for glue, let's say. Okay. 
And here on the left is where you add data sources. You can add something like chaos and it will add all of the repositories under the chaos um, organization. You can also load Git repositories directly or GitLab and Meetup. Those are the ones that we have supported right now. And once the data is collected, you see a green check mark, and then you can go to view project data to okay. see the data. And this is a default Kibana without any of the customizations that Remore Lab has. Yeah. And to start with, there's a contributor growth graph, hmm. a contributions graph, a timing on issues and pull requests, both or just one? I don't know. Jesus, do you know? Uh, I think in, in this case, it is uh, uh, issues, if I remember well. It, it's, it's annotated in the deck, so it's a bit small for me to see it in my screen. But you can you can see it. Yeah. And then meetups, which this community doesn't have meetups. Okay. And then there's one dashboard for each. So if you wanted to look at contributors in more detail, we can go to the contributors dashboard, which then has again not as many visualizations as you know from uh, Grimoire Lab. Uh -huh. It just has total number. This is the active contributors over time. Um, and it, these look almost identical. Very one, one, of the nice, one of the nice things is that if, uh, if you know about Kibana, you can write your own visualizations right out of the box. You go there. Can you, to can you do it here in Cauldron? Yeah. You can still do that. OK. okay. Yeah, you can, you can still go. To visualize. Yeah. That was part of my question. Like when I'm using Cauldron, like I know when I'm using Grimoire Lab locally, that there's a lot of that customization. And I was just wondering when it was served as a service like this, how much of that customization still exists. That's all, that was my question. But it, it sounds like a lot. So yeah, you can do a lot, but by default, there's not as much. Okay. And some of the data that is in the Grimoire Lab is not exposed here, like um, personal information, sure. names, emails, organizations. Okay. That's all stripped away. Okay. Can I ask a question too? What was the rationale, if you just stay on the screen, Georg, what was the rationale for picking like contributors growth or timing overview? Not a criticism. I'm just curious as to why, why you, it sounds like you're giving some people some dashboards out of the box. Right. And that's necessarily going to kind of control the narrative as to what people see. So what was the, was there a rationale for picking these or? Uh, I can, I can get that one. So it's, it's pretty much random right now. Okay. Uh, Caldron is still in alpha. So we decided to include some of the dashboards that okay. we have for the standard remote lab, adapt them a bit and uh, just, just to show that it works. Uh, okay. With time, our idea is to load with collections of uh, dashboard. So at some point, okay. I would like to have like the chaos collection, for instance. I so see. That we have uh, our metrics. Uh, uh, since everybody can do their own metrics, I also expect people sharing dashboards. Okay. But that's something that is not going to happen in the next few weeks. At some point, we want to include that into them. Into so far. For now, we're still uh, testing how quick we can get, uh, we can go get in repositories, how we can store the data I and see. all of that because it's okay. it's a bit a, a bit close to big data more more than than usual friends because we are having now thousands of repositories here and we try to have uh, hundreds of thousands of repositories so it's okay it's a matter of a scale right now okay and the and the panel selected like the contributor growth um to give some rational is basically that uh, as you know from the lab there are uh, tons of uh, big number of uh, possibilities of panels that are already there and they are quite overwhelming for the people so mm -hmm. we were for the cell so for the ones that we think that they are not that common but they are useful for example contributors growth is not only counting the number of people contributing to git or counting the number of people contributing to github or, or mm -hmm. it usually means there are three different charts 
is all together in one chart. So you can see where people are contributing in a single. So all of the mm -hmm. contributors are contributing to equally. So I think that makes a difference from any other tools in the market. And we want to put that in the front page of, of the code room here. Yep. At least uh, for this information. Yeah, I mean, I guess two two thing, two comments at least. These are just for me. These are just my comments. They're not <laughs> just yeah, looking at this. So this is how we can improve the thing. <laughs> I, um, so looking at this, I think this is uh, like a a big win. I mean, being able to have people, you know, kind of like with with Augur, Augur doing this, but but having this on the web as a service, I think is is huge, right? So I'm I think that's really nice. That's the use case. The use case is the people we think that wants to use this kind of technologies are not the ones that need to deal with Docker or Ansible yeah. or any of those school DevOps stuff. So basically, yep. I want to go somewhere, define my repositories and get some numbers. Yep. And I, and I think this is numbers. this creates like a lower entry ramp yeah. to, to the tooling that is and, kind of behind. And then once you have the numbers, basically you have a tool that is Kibana, that is, we are using Open Distro for this. So basically it's 100% free open source. So you can build your own visualizations on this. And then of course, as Jesus has said, the plan is, okay, let's put here also the chaos metrics. So people can import the chaos metrics and see, oh, this is how they look like. And then people can start working on them and even customize them for their own needs. So and this I, is a long-term long roadmap, I would say. And I, and I do think that when I was looking at these dashboards that Georg has up here, I do think, again, this is totally me, that, that um, being attentive to how you aggregate things is going to be really important. Like what you show people at, as, as your choice to show people is going to be really important because that's going to be the first thing that people see. Um, and people may or may not modify things. They, they may not even want to go down that road, but they're going to rely on what you're giving to them, would be my guess. Again, I'm not guaranteeing some, some causality or anything here, but um, I think you're going to have a lot of, a lot of influence as to what is in front of people. I think that's important to keep in mind. No, that's a very good point. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Matt. Thank you. All right. Any, any other comments on this? Thank you for sharing that, Georg. There's one... One more yeah. feature that I wanted to highlight is sure. when one of the features of Poltron is that the data needs to be only collected once for all of the users. So if I created a new dashboard, um, so by clicking on analyze a project, which doesn't have any data sources right now, and I said I wanted to analyze chaos, it would add all of the data that is already stored Mm -hmm. in the database. Sure, it's a month old, but it's there and I can immediately go and look at the data. So that's uh, another cool feature of this platform. How do you refresh it in that scenario? Refresh all. There's a button. Oh. <laughs> Stunning. <laughs> it just takes time. Okay. And the data will be refreshed for all the users. So basically that means that the most non project so the typical project that people want to analyze would be probably well refreshed. Okay, that's cool. All right, great. Um, that was nice. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any questions for Manrique or Jesus, Georg? Nope, not for me. Okay. Um, all right, so the next thing that I want to hit, thank you very much. I'm going to move off of software. So the next thing that I want to hit is this point three, and this is on metrics templates. So if you take a look in, in the shared document, one of the things that had come up was that for the first release, we had two different templates that we were using. So there were there were just two different templates and I, we knew this going into the release and we were okay with it. Um, but after the release, that was kind of bothering me a little bit <laughs> that we had two different templates and thinking about um, ways to just think through templating and, and Georg had really brought up some really good ideas as maybe it, ways to merge. And my other concern was that I was afraid the templates were um, at times a bit 
wordy when our goal around metrics was, this is really my primary concern, was really about describing what a metric is. And I thought the, the templates had gotten kind of long sometimes and sometimes a bit technical. And we were losing one of the forest through the trees kind of phrase. Or is, I think the trees can't see the forest through the trees. Something along those lines. <laughs> we're missing something. We're missing just kind of the, the core nature of describing what a metric is and what the objective of that metric is. Because um, I think that's that's really one of the goals here of these templates. So Georg had put together, if you take a look on page three, again, he brought this up last week as a way to bring together the two different metric templates. And it's really the work from the whole meeting last week. I just happened to be the one who wrote it down. Well, okay. So <laughs> it was everybody. So <laughs> that's cool. Um, so the, the idea here is that we would have really only four required headings, four required top level headings. And that and, and and at the same rate too, all of these headings are what is already occurring. So we're not asking for more or less really. It's just an opportunity to standardize on things and really kind of highlight these objectives, these descriptions and objectives. So if you take a look on um, point three, so we would retain the description of the metric. We would retain the objective of the metric as two high level um, uh, whatever headings. And then underneath there, we had this implementation component and we for a while had a bunch of different ways that implementations were being represented through the metrics whether it was through the filters and the visualizations, known implementations, sample implementations, success metrics as coming from the other templates, uh, data collection strategies. We had a bunch of different ways that we were all thinking about implementation and it ended up being um, what felt like kind of distributed throughout the metrics template. So what this implementation section would be is you would have an implementation here as your point three and then the smaller subheadings are optional as ways to represent the metric. So if it's in the case of say trace data metrics that say live in risk or evolution, you may gravitate towards things like filters and visualizations, tooling that is providing the metric, you know, things that you've been doing in the past. And in the case of diversity and inclusion work, um, really these bottom two were the two subheadings that were showing up more regularly, that it was collection strategies and success metrics. So really the, 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 the biggest change is right through here, implementation, and then kind of how you demonstrate that implementation. What are people's thoughts on this? Uh, what is success metrics? In the case of the second template that you mentioned there. So, Georg or Don, do you want to? We can bring it up. Let me bring. Uh, what up. was the question? What are success metrics? Uh, this is from the um, DNI working group, where when where we have a different concepts of a metric. When we talk about a metric, it's something like. Uh, speaker diversity at events. And then there are different ways to measure it, which could be percent of women on uh, keynote lists on the website. It could be a survey item asking, hey, did you feel properly represented by the speakers in this event? So there are different ways to collect information about this high level metric. Um, does that answer your question? I put a sample. Uh, maybe maybe the, the, the high level metric, as you say, is what uh, in some cases we are calling the, the goal. I mean, the thing that you want to understand. So and then take a look at that to metrics. Yeah. Do you, do you see the link I provided, Jesus? Right. Uh, I was looking at it. Let me check again. Okay. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand because I think that there is a bit of a, of a, um, of a difference between uh, uh, what we call the metrics in this case and in others. That's why I was asking. 
And uh, from my point of view, it's not that they are doing a different thing, but uh, we, they are, we are calling things in different ways. It's only that. Well, if we can continue so that, to refine that available list, that I would be happy. So with what that. I mean is, for instance, if, if we focus on uh, quantitative success metrics, um, if I if I had to map this according to what I did in for for evolution, for instance, uh, the the thing observe website for availability and pricing, blah blah blah, would be the goal. And then you set up some specific metrics that help you to understand that goal, like how many diversity access tokens are available, because that's a number, that's something that you can measure. Or things like what are the criteria for qualifying? I I'm, I have a hard time understanding that as a metric. The metric could be: is there a a, a, a criteria or or duration? Yeah. Let me let me chime in here. So maybe maybe in the case of this, I think this has come up before. Uh, what, what I mean is, it's it, it just maybe because of my, my past experience in other cases where usually we, we, when we talk about metrics, you need to quantify them. So yep. basically you need a number or you need, you need a boolean or something like that. While in this case, we have things that seem to be open-ended. Yep. So uh, I think that need to be evaluated later. And that, that's, that's where my mind rests. I don't mind well, I, if there's one thing or another, but we should explain because otherwise people expect a number assign it to a metric or something like like a number related to a metric. So I think that on this diversity access tickets, maybe success metrics is not the best header. Because I agree that the metric is really diversity access tickets. That is the metric. Yeah, so, so I, yeah, that, that, this is where we have uh, conflict here because there's no one single number that expresses diversity access tickets. Mm -hmm. It's something that we want to measure and then there's different ways we go about measuring it. And that's what the metrics down below are. That's where we get the Boolean values, the numbers, the Likert scale items. Yeah, but that's exactly the same case. For instance, if you want to measure activity in the project, and your, your goal is measuring activity, there are many metrics that can tell you about activity. So that you have a metric which is number of commits, another, another one which could be a number of issues open, whatever. All of those are the metrics, and in the end, what you try to understand is the activity of the project, for instance. But metric usually is linked to a number, and therefore the number, and therefore the name metric. Yeah. But if, if we want to define metrics in another way, that's fine with me. The only thing is, just to clarify, we, we should put somewhere very clear for us, metric is this thing, because otherwise people may get confused. Because people usually expect, my, in my experience at least, people usually expect metrics to be what uh, you have now, and or observe website, interview organizers, all of those items are metrics. Because basically they are either numbers or booleans, or something that can be yes, no. And then I understand that by aggregating all of that information, you decide the level of inclusiveness, for instance. And, and, and that's what I mean. In, so uh, in the end, of course, you need several metrics and you need to aggregate them in some way to learn about the goal, about your, your ultimate knowledge goal, which is what you want to know, whether this project is inclusive or not, for instance. So, but it's, some, it's only a matter of wording. So that's why uh, it also could be solved by saying, we are considering like metrics like this and this and just define that so that people understand. If you prefer not to change everything. So yeah, my, my yeah. yeah. So my take on this is that, that I'm gonna mute you. Yeah, okay. Um, if you take a look at, at the chaos metrics as they were released under diversity and inclusion, they follow the focus areas with a goal for that focus area around event diversity. And they have the metric, which is diversity access tickets, which really cannot be answered in a Boolean style mm -hmm. way. But from what I understand with diversity and inclusion, the goal is to understand, at least I hate to use the word goal, but the, the aim is to understand with respect to diversity access tickets, how they are, um, how they're used at an event in this case, and to gain clarity with respect to diversity access tickets as ultimately informing that higher level goal. 
And then the question obviously is associated with it. When I click on diversity access tickets as a metric, which I don't believe can in this case be measured by a Boolean, they have that subheading called success metrics. So there is actually metrics twice in this. There is the metric that is diversity access tickets. And then there is something called success metrics, which are like sub metrics to, <laughs> to the higher level. So it, it may be worth simply renaming something like success metrics to success criteria or success approaches or success considerations or just considerations. Because then the, the metric itself stays, this is, and this could be discussed in the working group itself, but the metric stays diversity access tickets. And there are ways, different ways to capture that information. Yeah, I do think success metrics as a term is a little bit misleading. Because we kind of say it twice. We have the metric and then success metrics for that metric. Mm -hmm. And it may be- oh, but, but, but in some cases you aggregate metrics and get some more, some more metrics. So you could have like metrics of different levels. As long as they are numbers or booleans, there is no problem with that. So for instance, when we are competing activity, you can get activity uh, in, in Git repositories and activity in issue trackers and activity uh, and, and you can, with all of that, you can produce a single number, which is something like from zero to one, how much active is this group? And that's still a number and that's still a, a, a metric. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my problem is not with that, it's the other way around, is with, uh, if we have a number, we have a metric, if we have a metric, we have a number. Anything else is another different thing. If we want to redefine, that's fine, but in that case, we should clarify. For metrics, we understand this and this. Uh, but I, I understand this is complex, uh, and, and, and every working group may have different ways of looking at, uh, at that. So um, I'm comfortable with any of the decision that you may take in the diversity and inclusion group anyway. Okay. Other thoughts on this? Yeah, maybe reword that. Thanks for jotting that down, Gary. Um, so if we do move forward with this, maybe I'll bring it to the working groups. And one of the challenges, maybe not challenges, but things to do is we'd have to go back through the metrics that were released with version one and rethink the, just how they're laid out for the second release that's coming up with FOSDEM. So obviously version one stays as it is, but we would have to just kind of rethink how we structure them. Again, this doesn't change any of the content. It's not adding content. It's not deleting content. It's mostly just headers and presenting that information. So the working groups would have to take that on because the goal would be if we're going to do this, we're going to do it prior to FOSDEM. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments on this? All right, um, let's see, I'm gonna go, we have 10 minutes left. I'm gonna, mm -hmm. somebody's getting skipped. Working groups getting skipped or events getting skipped. It's okay, <laughs> you don't have to cover everything every month. So I'd kind of like to go to events to be honest with you. Okay. So I think Chaos Con is coming along pretty well from what I understand, I don't know. Does anybody want to have a comment on that? For the I'm actually program? working on the pull request to put the CFP, to open the okay. CFP today and put it up on the website. So okay. we'll need some help from the Linux Foundation promoting it. Once that, uh, I'm still, I haven't submitted the pull request yet, but once the pull request gets merged, we will need some, some help promoting it. But I think we can okay. probably kick some of that off on the mailing list. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Anything else from folks on ChaosCon Europe? I know that Georg and I are still figuring out how to pay for the hotel. So I was talking with uh, Biturgia today and they can just book the hotel and then get reimbursed through Community Bridge. Okay. As I, as I, as you and I talked about Georg, I'm not a huge fan of that process. I would rather be able to handle, have our money in Community Bridge pay directly to the hotel. Yep, and Community Bridge currently does not support that. Yeah, so I don't know. I think we just need to keep encouraging them to support that. 
because I, I'm not a fan of, of having other people or other organizations basically put up the money and then we pay them back. That seems like a silly workflow. <laughs> seems like extra work to do, to do the same thing. It does seem like extra work, but the reality is I think every community event I've ever organized, uh -huh. some of this, some of this tends to happen because things like community bridge just aren't set up to pay for the things that I, we need. I have so high I, hope. I, I hope <laughs> deeply in my heart that we can, we can move beyond this. Maybe someday. <laughs> it doesn't prevent me or gear from asking and continuing to push to get it done. And the hope is, is that community bridge is relatively new. So I think a lot of this is still being worked out. And so maybe there's room to uh, enable this. Maybe it just hasn't. Some of the things they can't pay for might be changed as people start to use it. So. Say what now? Some I, of the again, things they cannot pay for could change as they evolve yes, what it is. Exactly. Once they figure out the mechanisms by which it works. All right, cool. Um, let's see. Website is Kevin, are you on? Uh, yes, I am. Sorry. For some reason, that was not uh, unmuting. So we will skip that. I was just curious as to if anything's changing on their social media. So on the website, I do have a pull request. Okay. Uh, to add the software working group meetings. Yep on the participate page and to also add information on how to access our community dashboard. For a community bridge? For the chaos.bridge.io. Oh, the okay. Community metrics. Okay. Okay, sounds good. You did it. <clears throat> Hands off. Okay. So Kevin, when you have time to add those modules, that would be great. Yep. And I'm kind of curious too, Kevin, maybe you can bring it up next week, but how the communication subgroup is going, if that's moving at all. Can you hear or, me now? Oh yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. I, I have no clue why you couldn't hear me earlier. Uh, I, I have gotten some response back from that email. So there, there are some individuals who are interested in, uh, okay. in working on uh, a communications group. Okay. Uh, Just so folks know, the, the premise here was we had kind of a variety of different electronic ways to reach out and just kind of creating a consistent way of thinking about this. And Kevin was leading that. So, okay. Sounds good. Um, next step, Kevin? Yeah. And bring yes. this. What's the next step for this group? Uh, I'm not certain yet. I was thinking I would uh, put out another call. Uh, the uh, I'm, I got a few responses, uh, but uh, possibly a call for a meeting to. Uh, possibly organize our thoughts around what the group would do. Okay. Yeah, right. I'd say go ahead and do that. Thank you. In regards to the, uh, the website uh, uh, participation page, the new modules, uh, did we want to go ahead and embed a calendar on that page? Oh, this thing. <laughs> so, uh, so Kevin has put together a calendar, which includes all of the chaos meetings. And I think we're going to put it up on, and we decided this, right? For at least fuzzy consensus that we can go ahead and put it up on the chaos.community page. And if people want to download this calendar, they can include it in their own calendar with all the caveats that come with that. However, the, however, the, the working groups generally won't be using that calendar to, um, to organize. So, and this is a calendar we can keep up to date as working groups change 
times, like DNI is talking about maybe moving their time a bit, then we can easily keep that. If we update it, do people have to? I think we're losing Matt. <laughs> This is that forever question. I don't know the answers to any of these things. Did I freeze or did? Yeah, froze. you froze. We didn't hear your question. So the okay. So the I figured I did. <laughs> so the the question was is if we make this calendar available on chaos.community, and then people choose to use it, right? They put it in their own calendar as a way to see chaos meetings. There are obviously caveats that come with that, as I have learned over the past few weeks. Um, but if we change, if there is a change to the calendar, so for example, DNI is talking about changing their time. If we change that calendar at that global level, is it reflected in people's individual calendars or do they have to re-download the calendar? See it what I'm saying? It depends on how they added it to their calendar. If they just cloned the event, then no. If they subscribe to the, IRS, the ICS file, then yes. So you can subscribe to an ICS file? Yes. OK. So Kevin, maybe in terms of making that abundantly clear, like if you're going to use this calendar, please subscribe to it. OK. Just a, a couple sentences of disclaimer. Yeah. But if you download it and add it and we make changes, <laughs> then that's not, not our problem. And also individual 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 uh, calendar invitations will be sent out by work maybe groups. maybe so, managed by working groups yeah yeah cuz not all working groups do that okay just a quick note i did submit that pull request kevin for the um, cfp for chaoscon okay i'll go ahead and uh, take a look at that cool Okay, we're at the top of the hour, everybody. Um, thanks for everybody's time. Until next time when I see everybody and you all see each other. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks again. Shoot.